Tim Gigep, Sagadam Hanach, Smoigit, Smoigit, Gabal Wiles. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Frontier Center for this kind of invitation. And I would like to uh, thank everybody in the room for the uh, very, very uh, wonderful furry welcome that everyone's given me. Uh, it's a uh, funny thing about Canada. Um, there's a few places you can go where you feel you're, you're at home. And uh, uh, a couple of people have been asking a little bit about my background, so I will, I will uh, give you a little, uh, little bit of information about me. I was brought up in a little reserve in northern BC uh, on the northwest coast. Uh, I was sent away from my community when I was 12 years old by my grandmother and my father. The reason that was uh, they did that was because uh, on the reserve the school was run by the federal government. And uh, like everything the federal government does, it was a hopeless screw-up. And uh, there was absolutely uh, no chance of getting a decent education out of that school system. And um, so uh, I was sent away to, to uh, get an education with the sort of vague idea that I would somehow help out Aboriginal people and, and people in poverty. And so uh, writing these books is one of the ways that uh, I... Uh, kind of express that, uh, or my, uh, I, I feel my obligation, and it's really become a passion for me. Um, I, uh, I come from a family of commercial fishermen, which uh, was a guarantee that you were going to be poor, but you had lots of fish to eat. Um, I tried my hand at commercial fishing when I was young, but as, as I say, uh, my, if my dad were here, he would introduce me as the only one who couldn't make it in the family business of fishing and as a result he would say um, I uh, had to become a lawyer and, and the way he would say that was uh, would imply that I brought great shame on a family otherwise engaged in an honorable business <laughs> um, I uh, originally wrote my first book and I was only thinking about Aboriginal people and the situation in which we were put uh, dances with dependency. People told me that, uh, that knew the Aboriginal community and the, uh, and the, um, the sort of uh, rule of uh, the Indian Act and Indian Act chiefs that um, I was really challenging the, uh, the privileges of a lot of uh, people that uh, are in what I call the Indian industry and that I would essentially be get beat up by everybody and was painting a target on my back. Fortunately, um, uh, that didn't happen. Um, the book became a six times bestseller largely because ordinary Aboriginal people um, accepted what I was saying and a lot of people uh, felt that it resonated with their collective experience. And so what I'm trying to do in writing these books is really just to make a difference. Uh, I had no idea you could get paid for speaking. Uh, I had no idea that you could make money being a writer. Uh, but um, uh, uh, this is what I'm doing and, and out of the first book in which I talked about the situation of Aboriginal people, I recognized that there are forms of uh, economic dependency that are universal. And so this new book is a, uh, an example of uh, putting together the principles of economic dependency that are universal for the first time. And it's just been released in, uh, in the U.S. this month, and the response already has been incredible. Um, I'm booked on radio programs and different media for, uh, for, for months here. And uh, I think what's happening is people feel that, uh, that what I've written about is really relevant for a relevant time in history. And in writing these things, um, I learned that it's really important to try to communicate with people, particularly if, if you're trying to help people that don't have a lot of education, um, to try and, and, and write and speak in a way that people can connect to. Otherwise, uh, I think there's no point in, in doing this. And in, in, in doing that, um, I try to take the words of the famous Apache chief Cochise to heart, who said in one of his speeches, speak straight so that your words go like sunlight to, your, to our hearts. 
And I believe that is a message that's really important because if you can connect to people emotionally, uh, you can uh, talk to them about uh, other things that uh, might be a little bit more intellectual. In writing my first book, I asked, well, why is this important now? Who cares about the situation of Aboriginal people if we've done this for a hundred or so years and, uh, and it, nobody's, we, the federal government has been prepared to sweep it under the, the uh, bureaucracy of the Department of Indian Affairs. Why is this important now? I have my personal reasons, being an Aboriginal person and seeing the misery that our community has had to go through because of this situation of enforced dependency that was created by specific government policy. And I have reasons that relate to the well-being of Canada. But in our uh, community, the government specifically created a, a situation where there was 100% um, reliance on the federal government. This graphic is intended to show that almost all of our wealth comes from the federal government, comes into our communities, and it goes almost right back out. Uh, anybody that's uh, taken a Business 101 course will tell you if all your, your uh, revenues are being earned from one source, that source uh, can basically put you out of business. Um, as well, it's just not a healthy way to, to run anything. Any OECD country like Canada or the US, in any of those countries, 80% of the wealth is created by the private sector. And so um, in that, that first book, I focused on those things. And so what I talked about was the demographic tsunami, how it was that, uh, that uh, at the time that I had written my first book, there was about $10 billion in transfer payments from the federal government to Indians and Inuit, and about another $10 billion in, in uh, services from the provinces and territories. And most people didn't realize that the Métis population is the, is the uh, only mixed blood population in the world that has their rights entrenched in a national constitution. So the Métis have been using that fact, and there may be a million of them, to establish uh, Métis rights as Aboriginal rights, and they say they want the same level of government programming as Indians and Inuit. So what the demographic tsunami is, is are we now talking about uh, $40 billion in social welfare spending at a time when a third of the Canadian population is uh, getting set to retire. Those people won't be paying into the national tax, uh, the tax coffers of our nation, and they themselves will be very reliant on federal government uh, social welfare programs. Um, clearly, that's not a sustainable situation. And I believe, particularly in provinces like uh, like uh, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, um, the Aboriginal pop population and the question of how to constructively get people involved in the economy and the workforce is, is, is probably our, our most pressing national question. Um, this idea of how to lift Aboriginal people up was addressed in the study that was done by the Center for the Study of Living Standards out of Ottawa. And they projected that if Aboriginal people were educated to the same level and received income parity as everybody else, best case scenario, cumulative by 2026, we could return $400 billion to the GDP of the country. Um, most people don't know what this little map represents. Of the 22, 21, 22 uh, treaties already settled in Northern Canada, Aboriginal people already own or their treaties already uh, impact over half the Canadian landmass. That doesn't really even include the, tip of the provinces. As a, as a nation of hewers of wood and drawers of water, and who have the great fortune, like Australia and Russia, to be sitting on natural resources at a time when uh, several large economies in the world need our resources, it's a very good situation, but it also gives Aboriginal people uh, huge leverage over resources. And uh, I took a trade mission to China uh, last year, or the year before, and uh, we went with five premiers from Canada. The Chinese at the highest level actually ignored largely the premiers and focused on our Aboriginal uh, trade delegation 
because they realize partially the situation of, uh, of resource uh, leverage or influence, but they also, uh, there also was a, a, uh, a cultural connection that's hard to define, but it, they, they went absolutely crazy over us. When we went into these big uh, uh, conferences where there were over a thousand people, uh, as soon as the Aboriginal people got, to, got up to speak, the Chinese paparazzi came out and, and we left China thinking that we were rock stars, but uh, we, we soon uh, had to uh, fall back to earth. Uh, what I'm here to talk about today is I, I wanted to, do, to give that as a brief introduction of my, my first book because that's what led to uh, this economic dependency trap. What I realized from looking at the situation of Aboriginal people is you cannot give people material things in the, uh, in the long term and, ex and expect them to do well. You can help people out in the short term by giving them material things. If you want, it, want them to do well, the only thing you really can give them is knowledge to help themselves. And that's why I'm writing these books. And I think like me, a lot of people uh, in, in mainstream society that don't understand the impacts of economic dependency uh, feel a bit like I did when I was uh, uh, growing up on the reserve. I felt like I was a tree in the forest because I couldn't see the forest. I couldn't see the forest and I couldn't understand why all of these things were happening to Aboriginal people. And as I started to research and study, I started to see patterns that started to emerge of how economic dependency came about. And uh, anyways, in my book I've written this little poem about a tree in the forest and it was just a, intended to try and convey that idea. And uh, <clears throat> what I think most of us don't understand, because we've all been brought up in an era when what has happened is we've been in a situation where we've been on this uh, ride where we've seen the social welfare system grow and grow and grow and grow to the point where people say we don't have a social safety net, we have a social safety hammock. And the implication is it's become so gilded that people have an expectation of cradle to grave sustenance without ever having to do a lick of work for it. And there's a real problem with that. The real problem is uh, starting to uh, come out in a variety of different ways, and I'll talk about those, but essentially the dependency ratio, those people that are working versus those that uh, aren't working, is growing uh, to uh, an unsustainable rate. And most of us don't realize, if you haven't gone through this exercise that I've done of this research, of where we came from. Where we came from as, as societies, and I, I talked about this in my book, uh, my first book for Aboriginal people, I said assume we were sailing through time and space for 10,000 years because that's what a lot of the tribes can say. They've lived in the same place for 10,000 years. There's archaeological evidence. Uh, and the question that uh, I posed was how come for, um, we've had these problems in the last three or 400 years and for 96 or 9,700 years we survived just fine without transfer payments, without uh, government welfare checks. Were our ancestors laying on the couch expecting uh, a welfare check? And the answer, of course, is clearly no. Uh, nobody could think that way. And when the first form of welfare was introduced into the U.S. as a result of the Great Depression and into other parts of the world, what uh, the the president at the time said in his State of the Union address, um, FDR, when he introduced it, is he really summarized and encapsulated the way all of our grandparents uh, thought about uh, the value of self-reliance and self-responsibility. And this is what he said, continued dependence on relief induces a spiritual and moral disintegration fundamentally destructive to the national fiber. fiber. To dole out relief in this way is to administer a narcotic, a subtle destroyer of the human spirit. 